Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You don't need to offer to pick them up and bring them to work because you heard that their car was they were having car trouble. They've been mistreating you. See, God doesn't give us the option to do what the world does. All right, Romans chapter 6. Now let me just tell you something about the book of Romans. You need to study Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 until you get it. And depending on how religious your brain is, you may have to study it for two or three years to finally get it. Because it begins to talk to us about how we're made right with God through Christ and not through what we do, not through our works. It talks to you about the flesh and the spirit. How you can want to do one thing in your spirit and want to do another entirely different thing in your flesh. The Apostle Paul talked about his dilemma, the same one that we all go through. Oh, what is my problem? The thing that I want to do, I can't do. The thing I don't want to do, I always end up doing. I try to practice good, but there's something at work in me that keeps making me do the wrong thing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then finally, oh, thank God, he will through Christ. So Paul was saying, I recognize two different things that work in me. Part of me wants to do good, and part of me wants to do bad. I need some help here. How can I get to the point where I always give in to the good? Well, only Christ can work that in us, and he does it by giving us the power and the grace that we need to walk in the will of God if we will ask for it. You've got to humble yourself and say, you don't, you don't just get up and say, God, oh, I'm going to go out today and be good to everybody. No, you say, God, help me get myself off my mind. Help me care more about making other people happy even than I do making myself happy. See, even the things that God has told us to do, we need his help to do them. I never get up there without asking God to help me. And you would think that I could do this in my sleep now. Every scripture that I have used this weekend, every single one of them, I've looked every one of them up and read them myself again and again before I came over here because I trust the power of the word more than I trust my own flesh. Took me a long time, but it's a place that we need to get to. So in Romans chapter 6, there's an amazing lesson that we need to learn. Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say to all this? Are we to remain in sin in order that God's grace, favor, and mercy might multiply and overflow? Now, of course, that's a ridiculous question, but... Paul was coming in now with this message of grace and he was talking to a lot of people who had lived under the law and they felt like that their rightness with God was based on them keeping the law. And you can't keep the law perfectly no matter what you do or how hard you try. And if you live under the law, if you break it in any point, then you're guilty of all of it. And so those poor people lived under that system making sacrifices for their sins for years and years and years and years and years. Now, Christ dies for us. He keeps the law perfectly. He paid the price for all of our freedom. And he says, I will give you grace. And where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. There's no way you can out -sin the goodness of God. So now these silly people are coming along saying, well, then I guess we don't even have to try not to sin. We'll just, because there's grace. And so I guess the more we sin, the more grace there'll be. And he said, in verse 2, certainly not. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Now, when we receive Christ, when we went into the baptismal waters, we came back out, we died to sin. The baptism is an outward sign of an inward decision to follow Christ. We're buried with Christ, resurrected to a brand new life. You say, well, what does it mean to be dead to sin? Well, it doesn't mean that sin is dead. Sin is alive and well, and there's temptation everywhere you go. But there's a part of us that is dead to it. The spiritual part of us does not want to sin. That's why when you receive Christ, in some ways, until you learn really the whole message here, you can actually be more miserable than you were before you got saved. Initially, you have this like little honeymoon type thing where everything is just like, oh my gosh, oh, oh, Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, you're everything. 
And then all of a sudden, God starts saying, okay, baby stage is over. Now it's time to grow up. And all the things that you used to do that didn't bother you at all, now all of a sudden, they bother you. What, what do you mean? I can't do that. Now I can't do this. Now I can't do that. Well, that's because the spiritual part of you that's dead to sin is no longer willing to put up with the fleshly part that does still have the sin principle in it. Now, I know I'm trying to download a lot here, so I hope I don't lose you, but if so, I'll believe that God will explain it to you after the meeting. How's that? Because <laughs> I can't really get this across if you don't understand yourself. If you're born again, in your spirit, you want to do what's right. And you have everything in you that you need to obey God. You've got self-control, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. It's all in you. But you still got a flesh. And your flesh is your body and your soul, the parts of your soul that are uncrucified. Or what that really means is the part of your soul that still has not been handed over to God. There's a war for man's soul. The Spirit of God wants all of you. The devil wants all of you. The Spirit works through your spirit to gain that access. The devil works through your flesh to gain that access. And that's why we feel some of the things that we feel. It doesn't mean that you're awful. It doesn't mean that you're weird. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It means that you're a human being that is still on your way to being continually and constantly changed. Amen? So our goal is to yield to God and to not yield to the devil. Are you all getting this? You're looking at me kind of like. <laughs> Who are you going to give in to? Which temptation are you going to take? To me, I think this is a super simple way to explain this. How many of you are ever tempted to forgive somebody, but you don't? <laughs> yeah, don't give me this stuff. <laughs> If I say, who wants a miracle, you can get those hands up. <laughs> Think about it. Are you ever tempted to give more in the offering than you do? <laughs> <laughs> if I asked right now, could somebody get me a glass of water? I mean, there'd be a massive bolt to the door trying to <laughs> get me water. But if maybe your husband walks by at home, <laughs> says, would you mind to get me some water? You're like, you think I'm your slave? Get your own water. <laughs> Woo, got you, didn't I? I mean, I'm serious. I'm at the point in my life where my goal is to give in to the temptations of God. To give in when he tempts me to do something good. And I'll tell you the truth. The Bible says if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's the good thing. The book that I wrote on habits, I didn't say breaking bad habits, making good habits. I called it making good habits, breaking bad habits. Because the truth is, you don't need to fight with all the bad. You just need to concentrate on developing the good. Then there won't be any room in your life for the bad. Amen. You don't need to look at everything that's wrong with you all the time. Look more at Christ. Look into his word. Begin to do the things that he wants you to do. And pretty soon you'll just say, my gosh, I'm changing and I don't even know how it all happened. Amen. Keeps us on the positive side of life. Now, he says you're dead to sin. Look at verse 11. Romans 6, 11. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin and your relationship to it broken, but that you're alive to God living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Now, consider yourself means how do you think about these things? The bottom line truth is, is you're never going to go beyond what you believe. So no matter how dead you are to sin in the spirit, if you don't believe that, then it's not going to help you. I think we really need to do a lot of pondering about what do we really believe. Do I really believe that I'm called to do this and that I've heard from God about what I'm going to preach today? Well, then if I really believe that, there is no need at all for me to even let the enemy even tempt me to think that this is no good and then I got the wrong message. See, I gave up all that a long time ago because I don't get up here to be tormented. I get up here to follow God and to bring you what I believe is a word from the Lord. 
How many of you ever make a decision that you believe you've really heard from God about, and then you get in the middle of it, and the devil starts telling you that you didn't, you're doing the wrong thing? Okay. Well, see, that's when you need to say, no, I believe I heard from God. It's what you believe that determines whether or not you're going to have peace or whether or not you're going to have misery. Now, verse 12. Let not sin therefore rule as kings in your mortal short-lived perishable bodies to make you yield <laughs> to its cravings and be subject to its lusts and evil passions. Do not continue offering or yielding your bodily members and faculties to sin as instruments and tools of wickedness, but offer and yield yourselves to God as though you have been raised from the dead to perpetual life and all of your bodily members and faculties to God, presenting them as implements of righteousness. So here's what I recommend. Every morning when you get up and you have your God time, I hope you have God time every morning. Form the God habit in your life. You say, God, here I am. I know that you live in my spirit. I thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving all my sins. Now, I'm yours today. You use my mouth. You use my mind. You use my eyes. You use my hands. You use my money. Now we start getting nervous. <laughs> oh. But it's my money. No, it ain't. We're stewards, not owners, and we wouldn't have one cent if God wouldn't have given it to us. And you don't ever have to worry because if you do what God tells you to with your money, you'll have more than what you could have ever had if you try to manage it all yourself. God's system of finance is absolutely phenomenal. Here I am. I bring you all my faculties, everything that I have. My time is yours. Everything belongs to you, God. Now, you use me however you want to today. And you are sincere when you say it. You go out. You really think you're going to go out and not have any opposition from the devil? Now, he's going to tempt you to think, you didn't hear from God. That's ridiculous. Other people don't live that way. You don't need to do that. You don't need to forgive them. If you do that, they're just going to take advantage of you. You don't, you don't need to invite them to your party. They didn't invite you to their party. You don't need to offer to pick them up and bring them to work because you heard that their car was, they were having car trouble. They've been mistreating you. <laughs> See, God doesn't give us the option to do what the world does. He gives us the option to do what he would do. Which option do you want to take? Is this making any sense to anybody? How many of you think maybe you've been taking the wrong option in a lot of ways? All right. Now. The world is not our home. We're passing through. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. To me, serving God is so exciting. When you, when you live the way that I'm talking about, where you're not just trying to run your own life and expecting God to bless it, but you offer yourself to Him and I know that sometimes that provokes fear. Well, will I not get anything I want? Yes, you certainly will. You'll get more of what you want than you would have trying to do it the other way. You don't look like you believe me, but that's okay. <laughs> Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, your lower nature that wage war against the soul. He says, you're aliens and strangers here. Truly, we are just passing through. Billy Graham, who is now 95, has written a book called Almost Home. I love that title. You know what? When I turned about 65, I remember thinking, you know what? I've lived two-thirds of my life. I'm a lot closer to being home than what I was. I'm glad that he didn't write a book called Almost Dead. Think about that. We're just passing through. This is not our home. The older you get, the closer you are to home. 
and I want to live my life caring a little more about eternity because that's a whole lot longer than these few years, even if I live a hundred years. And you know what? I can remember a time where if I would have been facing death, I would have been so frightened and felt like I was being so cheated because my life had not been any good up until that point. But I can honestly tell you, I'm ready. And I've had a good ride. And God has fulfilled his word. And he's given me something great to do by being able to share the word with people. But it's not all by accident. A lot of it is choices that we make. I could have stayed bitter. I could have hated my dad until the day that I died. But it would have just messed up my life here. I couldn't have been doing what I'm doing now. We have options. Do you understand me? You don't have to just live like the world or do everything that your flesh demands that you do. We have an option, and our option is, is through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can resist the temptations of Satan, and we can yield to God, and we can be people who every time we're tempted to do something good, we do it. Woohoo! You know, I want to encourage you this morning to beware of attachments. <laughs> we get attached to things, and it's a very dangerous thing. Let's talk about people. <laughs> Acts 5.29 says we must obey God rather than man. If you're letting somebody else make your decisions, if you're letting the threat of losing somebody else's friendship, if you're letting that make you compromise, what you know is right. Don't be so attached to people that you let them steal the kingdom life that God wants to give you. Are you there? Don't be that attached to people. How many women are there? Beautiful women who make such wrong choices with men because they're afraid they won't keep them if they don't. You know, if you have to lose everything that God wants to give you and defile yourself to keep relationship with somebody, then you don't need it. You don't need it. If we care too much about our reputation with people, we will pay a high price. There is a high price for low living. How about being attached to places? I wonder how many people are attached to a church that they've been going to for most of their life. They're not fed spiritually there. They don't get anything. They don't grow. They sleep through most of what's going on. They dread getting there. They can't wait till it gets over. But they stay because their friends are there. They're used to it. It's not far from the house. That other church I'd really like to go to, my goodness, that'd take me 30 minutes to get there. <laughs> Come on now, we'll drive an hour to get to a 75% off sale. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you can't be attached to places. You get yourself in a church where you're going to grow, where the Word is going to not only comfort you, but it's also going to confront you occasionally. You get somewhere where people really love you and care about you, and they're going to hold you accountable and want to know where you're at if you ain't there. Don't keep hanging on to all these people that are poisoning your life and don't care anything about you anyway. Go through a period of loneliness if you need to, and let God give you some real friends. Come on. Let's think about Abraham for a minute. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. This is probably the best example I, I know of. Now in Haran, the Lord said to Abram, because he had not been renamed Abraham yet, go for yourself, <laughs> for your own advantage, away from your country, away from your relatives, away from your father's house, to the place that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, 
And I will bless you with an abundant increase of favors. And I will make your name famous and distinguished. And you will be a blessing, dispensing good to others. Now, the thing you may not know is that Abraham and all of his relatives were idol worshipers. And God interrupted Abraham's life and gave him an option. He said, look, if you're willing to get away from all this, wonder how attached he was to his home, to his country, to his cousins, all of his friends. What if Abraham would have said, I, I just can't leave. It's just too much. And God didn't even tell him where to go. That's the kicker. He said, you leave and go to a place that I will show you after you go. And if you do that, if you lay down this low life, <laughs> come on now. If you lay down this low life, here's the higher life I'm going to give you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you an abundant increase of favor. I'm going to make you wealthy. I'm going to give you fame. I'm going to make your name famous. And I'm going to make you a blessing to other people everywhere that you go. God can bring you to a point where you are more interested in being a blessing than you are in being blessed. And let me tell you something, that's when you've arrived in God's economy. Don't be attached to positions. <laughs> Amen? I worked at a church in my city for five years and my friends were there, got my paycheck there. I didn't have to believe for it, the pastor did. And I had some opportunity there, but God had greater opportunities waiting for me. But I needed to leave my job at the church. I didn't have to leave the church, but I needed to leave my job at the church because I couldn't pursue what I felt like that God wanted me to do and keep my job there. And for two whole years, I totally disobeyed God. And I got more miserable and more miserable and more miserable and more miserable. And I started having all kinds of nonsense go on in my life, people coming against me, trial, just goofy, crazy stuff. And I had to learn that I was attached to that place, those people, that position. I had honor there. My seat had my name on it. I had a parking place in the parking lot with my name on it. Woohoo! I was important there. And you see, I'd been abused, and I, I wanted to be important. I wanted to feel important. But God didn't want me to get it that way. If you give up your reputation here, you can have a better reputation in heaven. Did you hear me? Finally, I walked away, and we see what's happening now. It scares me sometimes to think what would have happened if I would have stayed. I wonder how many things God's told you to get away from. And I'm not talking about walking out in your marriage, so don't be. <laughs> but you might need to make some stronger decisions to not let that person who maybe is not living the right life determine what your behavior is going to be. I mean, there's nothing saying that you can't say, hey, I love you and I want this to work out, but I'm not going to disobey God. Come on. But I know full well that some of you are hanging around with people that are poisoning you. And if you would just make a decision to give that up and maybe be lonely for a period of time to honor God, God will bring blessing in your life if you'll do that. You know, John the Baptist was completely willing to lay down his position when Jesus came on the scene. He was a forerunner to Jesus. And when Jesus came, he said, he must increase and now I must decrease. You know, we have to know how to discern the seasons in our life. And there was a long period of time, long season, where Dave and I ran everything at the ministry. We had our hands in everything, every decision we were involved in. And it got to the point where it was killing me because I was traveling too much and I couldn't do all that and I didn't even want to do it anymore. And God had provided our two sons 
And we loved the fact that they worked there and helped with the work, but we weren't as hot on giving them authority. And <laughs> and so we finally turned basically the running of the ministry over to them, and they only come to us with things that they absolutely cannot solve. And I got so much peace, it's pathetic. Yeah. It's wonderful. And a lot of things got better. But see, I had to be willing to pass that torch on and go into a new season in my life. Well, there is a high cost to low living. We can choose to live to please others and give up the life that we could have in God. Or we can follow Christ and whatever we give up for the kingdom will ultimately bring the best life that God can possibly give us. The choice is yours. Today, we are having a medical camp on behalf of Joyce Mayer Ministries. It's a big event for the village people so that they can receive medication and the love of Christ. That's what is happening here right now. There are so many instances where people who have come here, they have been suffering from those diseases or infections from quite a long, but they never go to a medical health because they don't have a finance even for travel. People are quite receptive to us because they are seeing that we are helping them beyond just sharing the gospel. And this event has been uh, being planned in our minds and hearts for the past two, three months. So the church in Hyderabad is praying and the village church has been praying continuously. And that's what we are seeing that God's grace, everything is going on smoothly. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution to India and because of your help, you are, we are you making us to go every corner, looking every place. And without your support, we cannot go. Met deze mobiele kliniek geven we bij Hand of Hope elke maand nieuwe hoop aan duizenden mensen. Hier krijgen de patiënten alles op één plek: van oogtesten tot röntgenfoto's tot het verstrekken van medicatie. En dat allemaal dankzij de vele donateurs die dit werk steunen. of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Werk, huishouden, vrije tijd en nog veel meer. Het moederschap is een fulltime uitdaging. Groeit alles je soms boven het hoofd? Krijg weer rust, zelfvertrouwen en vreugde die dieper gaat. Laat je inspireren door Joyce Meyer, zelfmoeder van vier kinderen. Je hebt het verdiend. Het boek van Joyce Meyer, de zelfverzekerde moeder. Bestel je eigen exemplaar nu via joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch via 026 2022 100. Vragen? Bel ons op. Wij zijn er voor je. Telefoonnummer 026 20 22 100.